very welcome. Uh, well, all the people who only like music, left. The people who like Haskell, at least, I guess, I guess left. Uh, well, sorry, they left. The people who like Haskell left. Uh, stayed on. They're still left. Uh, so who never programs in Haskell? No. Never, ever. Well, or or like, they did it, they just said it, they never wanted to do it. I never programmed in Haskell very much because I have students do that for me, right? So I've never, really, I've never done Mona Transformers. I've never oh, done DLT. Yeah. 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 I'm not loud enough. Good. Yeah, so so because I mean, not that I'm out to make converts. I mean, I don't care whether you program in Haskell or not. But I would also be interested in people working in different languages, saying, "Well, this is something I'd like to have." So what what do we, what do I'm talking what am I talking about? It's about how to customize type error diagnosis, and it's a bit a specific. Uh, goal in mind is to make type error messages, yeah, the things that you always get when you make a mistake and the compiler knows about it, uh, yeah, those messages to make them better explain what you did wrong. And in particular, when the libraries that you write and when you make a mistake, they actually represent embedded domain-specific languages that you can actually make the error messages domain-specific. So you use a parser combinator library and all of a sudden your error messages talk about, talk about parsers. Yeah, a normal Haskell compiler cannot do that. You have to train it to do that. Uh, so I, uh, me and my PhD student there, Alejandro Serrano Vena, uh, we've investigated this for, uh, for four years or so. And we came up with a lot of, I think, neat stuff. We've published this at uh, conferences. But this is all prototype stuff, right? It's because we need to set up the type inference mechanism in a particular way so it works for us. And then at some point, we said, well, actually, we just want to see what if, of all the things we've developed, what can we get in GHC with almost no effort? So that's what this talk is about. So I mean, I don't know what do you, where you come from. So I'm in a situation where I have a statically typed language, a strongly statically typed language, like Haskell. It comes equipped with an intrinsic type system. This is a new thing for me. So it's an intrinsic type system that tries to prevent structurally correct but semantically, nonsense programs from being compiled. And this is the well-worn slogan that well-typed programs can, can't go wrong. It might still not implement what you want, but you will not be adding booleans to strings, and those kinds of things. And, but if you have a type incorrect program, uh, yeah, the compiler should inform you it's type incorrect, and preferably say a few more things on how to fix it or whatever. And there is this need for diagnosis. And this is usually where compiler builders say, well, uh, pfft, I don't want to do this. I, I, I like to generate fast code, but having to spend all this time on explaining error diagnosis, boring, boring, boring. Yeah. So this is my field, type error diagnosis, to the problem of communicating to the programmer and or why his program is not type correct. And this involves, depending on the compiler, some information like, first of all, that it is type incorrect. And that's always nice to know. Some compilers don't do this. And this is a non-statically typed program language. Uh, it would be nice to say what kind of inconsistency is it? Is it kind of a unification error, or is it a type class constraint that could not be resolved? Things like that. It might also tell you these are, these are the parts of the program that, that are involved in the conflict. And whatever you fix, it has to be in that part and none of the other parts. This is called type error slicing, also a field of itself. And even better might be is that it actually tells you, oh, but this is how you fix the problem. I know this problem. Now, if you look at the literature, there's very, very little about type error diagnosis for languages like Java, even for Java. That has a type system. It has an intrinsic type system, but it's very little. I, I think I wrote the only two or three papers about that. Uh, nobody's interested, it seems. There's actually a PhD thesis on Scala, but almost no papers about Scala, for example. And it's still quite a problem. Uh, in functional languages, traditionally, there have been eh, because it's so rich in its uh, yeah, higher order functions, parametric polymorphism, there's much more room for mistakes, it seems. So decades ago already, people started doing work on this. And whatever I'm doing is kind of like a uh, part of that big body of literature. So, so it's a problem in functional programming, but not just in functional programming, because languages grow. I mean, we've seen it over the last decades that, that all of a sudden OO language starts to support functional stuff because of parallelism. Uh, Java has seen introduction of parametric polymorphism. Well, error diagnosis suffered. Then they introduced anonymous functions. I have not dared look. All right. Languages like Scala, they embrace multiple paradigms. The 
type system of SCADA itself is actually quite complicated. Local type inference is much more complicated, at least to understand and to diagnose, I think, than, than Hindley Milner's algorithm that, that Haskell uses. So you have to do a bit more effort to get more powerful type systems, and particularly parametric polymorphism and uh, subtyping, they bite each other quite often. So I've been talking to Odersky as well for, for a number of times, and then he, he mentions this type wall. He says, well, we can invent more and more and complex type systems, but at some point, if you don't also address the diagnosis, programmers are gonna kind of hit a wall there saying, well, yeah, I'm making all these mistakes, but you cannot explain what I'm doing wrong. So I'm going to closure, I'm going to Erlang, I'm going to, to non-statically type languages, because then I don't at least, I don't get complaints. I just get runtime errors, uh, but they're much easier to fix, maybe. And he talked about the implicit yesterday, but he didn't talk about what that does to the error diagnosis. He had some ideas, he thought. Okay. Well, there's a new trend as well. I mean, dynamic languages are dynamic, but everybody also finds out if you apply dynamic languages all over the place in your company, you'll find out that, yeah, over 1,000 lines, 20,000 lines of codes with more than five developers, you also run into a wall, right? The maintainability wall. Uh, wall. So then you get languages like Hack, like TypeScript, that by piece by piece introduce types, but then again, error diagnosis were rare. It's ugly. So here I have a number of examples uh, of things in Haskell. Yeah, so it's all Haskell, uh, where I make a mistake and I'm not that happy with the kind of diagnosis I get. So this is Bryn Jordi's diagrams library. He has a function at the top that takes two pictures, so a Q, Q diagram is basically a picture. And it can be a three-dimensional picture or a two-dimensional picture, depending on what this actually this V is. That's the vector space. Uh, and you can put these two on top of each other, and then you get a new picture out. So this is basically take a picture, put one on top. That's the new picture. Very easy. I mean, yeah, everybody, I guess, knows how you can do that. Now, if I write things like a top true, then it basically says, yeah, but I expect my first argument to be something like a Q diagram B, V, N, M. But it doesn't talk about what is a Q diagram. Yeah, maybe this is something that's not completely clear to the, to the program. Uh, if I put a 3D cube on a 2D, 2D plane, it will complain that they're not living in the same vector space because one is a 2D picture and the other is a 3D picture. And it talks about matching type V2 with type V3. But it would be really nice if this message could actually talk about vector spaces, right? That's the domain term that is associated with this particular component. B, for example, represents the back end. And M represents the metric space. So these are all things that mean something to the guy who developed this domain-specific library. But Haskell doesn't notice. It cannot notice because yeah, then you would have to build all kinds of domain information about all the EDSLs on Hackage that have been implemented. But wouldn't it be nice if the compiler developer, sorry, the EDSL developer could kind of add this kind of information to his uh, library so that the error messages would actually talk about vector spaces instead? Well, that's what I do. Another one is the left on the chart. So we have type classes in Haskell. There's a persistent library for working with databases. Uh, and the idea is that you can search for, uh, you can insert unique records in there, but you can only do that because it's very type safe if you have, um, uh, the persist entity instance for the types that you use in your database. And it's just a matter of putting a deriving somewhere and actually the, 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 the yeasteldweb.com uh, manual actually explains how you can easily do that. You don't even have to think about it. You can just write a piece of text somewhere that will fix it. But now you would like to get something, a message that tells you exactly this. This is where I go to find out how I can fix this. The formatting libraries like a type safe printf yeah, the printf that I hope everybody kind of knows a little bit from, from C. Yeah? But this is a type safe printf. And what, I want to, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm building a formatter that will just print the text hello world. There are no arguments here like in a normal printf. It's possible, but this is just a simple example. Now this now function, it just says I already have the text available that I want to print when you print this message. So it's just a literal string. But the thing is this now guy actually doesn't expect a string. He expects a t dot build. And somebody started shooting. <laughs> Further from here? OK. So, so actually, this now actually expects some kind of other data type, data structure, which is called a builder. Now, as it happens, uh, 
Yeah, this is actually maybe quite unexpected. In fact, it might be that you found this piece of code on the internet and you just copied it and then it doesn't work. And uh, later I'll explain why actually this might happen. None. Yeah, but it would be nice to actually have a way of fixing the problem and that this error message would suggest it and we can, we can do that too. So this is actually an expression with a parsing lambda abstraction. So this is the slash, this is the arrow, these are the list of arguments, this is the body. And then actually you get this error message if you do this in hugs, for example. And the only thing that is actually wrong here is that this, le this greater than equal, uh, this greater than uh, wrangle bracket should actually be omitted and then everything is typed correct. And I call, we call these siblings because this function, which has a different type from the function in which this particular symbol is missing, they're easily confused. You would like to have a message from the compiler saying, oh, you use this, it's incorrect, but if you replace it by this other function, it will actually work. It will be typed correct. Might not be what you intend, but it, might, it will be typed correct. And now this is the message you get. It doesn't talk about parsers, anything, which is not so nice. And then finally, I came up with this idea yesterday about simplifying monads. So, so this is the message you get when you, the OK is OK. I'm doing something with the IO monad. That's fine. Everybody should be able to work with the IO monad. But uh, it's not okay at this point to work in the maybe monad because this student hasn't gotten his monad license yet. Uh, and, and again, with what we do, you can actually have, have this and actually explain, okay, this is, you're not allowed to do this kind of thing yet. Uh, may come back next, again next week. Yeah, so these are the kind of tricks you can play with whatever we do. And what we do is domain specific type of diagnosis. So this all starts with the notion of an embedded domain specific language. <laughs> But he did. You did, right? This one? But it is not indeed comments. You all of the mics you're saying. Okay, good idea. Yeah, you think so? Right. We need a better error message. Yeah, it's that was the error. All right. I can still talk? Okay. So while well, Hitala, for example, gave in his, uh, one of his keynotes a definition of a domain-specific language, that you have a domain which is the well-defined and central. There is a notation for expressing, well, in our case, programs in that domain. Uh, the informal meaning is clear, so you can explain it in a manual, but, and this kind of distinguishes it from a jargon, the formal meaning is clear and implemented. So yeah, this is what he says is a DSL. One thing that is missing, I was at the, when I read this, I thought, well, this is nice, but there's something missing, is that there should not be a leakage of domain abstractions when you actually use this implementation. Yeah, so an implementation of the DSL should be able to imp communicate with the program in terms of the DSL, and not in terms of the underlying encoding, which is normally the case. Okay. So embedded domain-specific languages, what's the idea there? Well, you take a domain-specific language and you implement it as a kind of a library inside a suitably powerful programming language. And so this is something that we can easily do in Haskell. There's lots of nice advantages like reuse of existing libraries, compiles IDEs, you can easily combine EDSLs, and at the very least, you can use it to prototype your domain-specific languages. And maybe later you build your own tool chain because it's a very important domain-specific language like SQL, but, but maybe this is good enough for you. Now, there are, of course, lots of host languages, and typically these host languages, maybe it helps if I stand here. So maybe these host languages are uh, typically are general purpose languages, but there are a few languages that are really well suited for this kind of thing, like, uh, like Ruby, for example, or Haskell, and, and C++ using templates. Yeah, people have been using this to embed their DSLs inside a general purpose language. And to me, uh, what is an EDSL? How does it distinguish from a library in, in Haskell, if you look on Hackett's or whatever? Well, to me, it's like a library that has a certain fluency yeah, that resonates with the people that work in that domain. They say, oh, yeah, this actually looks like something I, I know, even if I don't know Haskell. Yeah, but this is all fake, and I don't really care that much. So there are challenges. One is optimizations, but today we look at domain-specific error diagnosis. And the idea is what I want to have, I want to have control of the error diagnosis when errors are reported for programs written with a particular domain-specific language. And can we do that? Oh, well, yeah, we can. So I've worked with Bastian here a long time, some time ago, and now Alejandro Serrano Mena, and we actually can do this quite well, I think. But which of these ideas can we actually build into GHC? Eh? 
so that we can give something to the functional programmer community to play with. Uh, and that's the final part of my talk, and maybe the, the core of my talk. So, as it happens, uh, there have been a few developments in GHC that actually make our life relatively easy. So one of the things is the introduction of the type error uh, class, where basically you say, if I ever find a piece of code that demands that I have a show instance for functions, then I will re re rewrite that to a type error thing, where this message actually will be displayed to the programmer. That basically tells you, I will never want to write a show instance for function types. So when it does occur to have, when it actually does happen, it's probably a mistake on my part. And in this case, usually it says, okay, maybe you're not, you shouldn't be comparing functions or showing functions, but you actually want to show a function applied to an argument and you forgot the argument. Right? Um, so it actually leverages type level programming techniques like this type level text and type level string concatenation, actually text concatenation that we also can now reuse for our own approach. But it's fairly restricted. It's only available for type classes and type family resolution. You cannot change the order in which constraints are considered and you cannot uh, have messages depend on who generated the constraint. So these are the things we'd like to have. So this is what we do. Now we provide control over the content of the type error message. We provide some control, but not all the control we would like to have. For that, we would need the changes to GC would be much more invasive. Uh, but the nice, really nice thing I think of this approach is that you can use GHC's type level programming abstraction features to reuse all the error diagnosis we've done for one library to another library. So lots of things we can kind of write, we can reuse in many places. And this is really nice. So it's basically a type level embedded DSL for diagnosing embedded DSLs. Click. We've integrated this in the patch of GHC. Uh, what I have my, my mine runs 8.1 point something, and, and Alejandro is now at 8.3 point something. It works. And another thing is that soundness and completeness, they kind of come for free. I mean, if you change the error diagnosis, may you not also change the types associated with the function. That's a risk. But we can easily prevent that because actually GHC will check this for it. All right, and this is the, the slogan that you get expression level error messages by type level programming, one level up. Now, we only wanted to do this if it didn't involve too many changes to the compiler because when, yeah, there are people in charge, sort of in charge of GHC, they don't like uh, in extensive changes to the compiler, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, only if it was very easy to add and change and in a small part of the compiler, then we allowed ourselves to do it. So the, inside GHC, we need some kind of uh, way of tracking the messages associated with constraints and we need to deal with priorities because we sometimes want to control a little bit the order in which constraints are resolved or considered. Um, but actually the type error and the constraint kind do most of the heavy lifting for us. We need to, to add a few things to the type lists files, which is in the compiler, it's just like 20 lines of code. And we added a new module type errors, which are basically exposed to the API that I will explain to you uh, in a minute. We do need lots of fancy type level extensions. So these are the ones that we need to implement all this stuff. The EDSL programmer only needs the first four, these ones. And the EDSL user, EDSL user typically none except that at 8.3 all of a sudden we need to allow ambiguous types sometimes. So probably something changed there. Yeah, well I was hoping maybe Simon knew, but he doesn't. Okay, let's start with a great mistake. So this is uh, an identity function. I gave it a prime because it's my identity function. It just does the same what an identity function does. And of course, if I give it a boolean, it will return an integer because it's the identity function. It, whatever I provide it, it shall return. Uh, this is the error message you get. Take it some time to read it. And this is how you encode it in Haskell. So here I have my own ID function, ID prime. And what it does, huh? it's a wrapper for my original ID function. The the, simply the prelude version, the ID from the prelude uh, that I also import. And I will export this ID prime to the rest of the world. And if they use it, they get this error message and not the standard error message. So what does it do? Well, it has this custom errors type class, which is just a way of saying, okay, there are some customized errors coming up. That's all it says. It's just syntax. Necessary, but... 
these are type level lists. Let's forget about them for a minute. The re really interesting part is that I say, well, ID prime is a function from A to B. Ah, but that's not true. I hear you say it should be a function from A to A. That's why I'm checking the fact that A is not equal to B over there. Because if, I, if my checker knows that A can never be equal to B, for example, because it knows that A is an int and B is a bool, this is what we call in the partners check, whatever happens in the future, if A is int and B is bool, they can never become the same. And I know that this is an error. If I know that this is an error, I can generate this error message that I construct here. And this error message is a message saying, hi, please read this error message, a great error message, exactly what I had here. And this is normal concatenation of texts, and this is putting two texts above each other. Yeah, these are the only two I think I need to build my texts. The text is actually displayed to the programmer. Uh, there's one other thing here, is this versus AB. Um, so you might say, so here, for example, you see boo, because sometimes I don't, I don't just want to give literal strings. I also want to kind of give you information about uh, what types did I actually compare here, right? And this is what this type level function versus the type level function versus does. It will actually compute this text using built-in things from DHC like show type and so forth. But we'll see some more examples of that later, right? So this E you should not worry about too much because, I mean, text is something that lives at the expression level, but I need text that live at the type level, so I need to distinguish between them. So that's why you need this qualifier. Um, the fact that I can write it prime equal to it ensures that my it prime is sound, although not necessarily complete. This could be a more restrictive type, but it cannot be a more general type than the original it. This is checked by the Haskell type checker. And if you don't want to have the runtime overhead of, of having this, then you can just write it in line to get rid of that. And that's something that GHC uh, supports out of the box. All right? So what I'm actually doing here all of, most of the time is we actually have constraints. Right? These are all constraint-like things that we can actually manipulate. And, and we do that by me. Yeah, so these things live in a special kind that's introduced in GHC, not by us, but by people before us, and this is called this constraint kind, and we apply these type level programming things that we have to these constraints. So you can actually already use this in your ordinary Haskell, well, maybe not ordinary Haskell. So if you're lazy, you say, well, I want to have show int, show bool, show blah, show blah, answer what, show bleep, and ever. You can, of course, repeatedly write all these shows, but you can also write a type family all that will kind of map show over all the types in this type level list. That's something you can do. Well, this is the kind of thing we actually exploit. And I think this actually stopped working. Oh, no. Hey. I have to be a bit closer. OK. Yeah, so this opens the door to manipulating constraints and having these type error messages in a reusable fashion. So this is one of my running examples. The top that we saw earlier, you take a diagram and another diagram, you put them on top. But we see that they have to agree on the back end. They have to agree on the vector space. They have to agree on the other two parameters. Yeah, these have to agree on the on the meta, on the, the semi-group that they were. They have to agree on the ordered field. And these are all type classes again. Yeah, so all of these things have to be the same. Now, I can rewrite these explicitly using constraints saying, well, actually, it's a function from D1 to D2 and D to D1. Uh, but I also have to check then that D1 is something like a diagram, that D2 is something like a diagram, and that element-wise here, B1 equals B2, V1 equals V2, N1 equals M2, and M1 equals M2. And this exactly represent, together with these type class constraints, is exactly the same as this type, but only written down explicitly using constraints. That's all there is to it. Huh? But yeah, to a compiler, this equality is actually not any different from this equality. But what I want is that, well, this message should say something about backends not matching, and this error message should say something about vector spaces not matching, because that's the domain information that they represent. Okay. So how can you do that? Well, we do that by means of this apartness. So what is apartness? Apartness is a check yeah, that says it will succeed if it knows that it's two, ar two types that it gets that these arguments can never be made into the same type by any other constraint resolution later on. So int and bool are apart. List of a and list of int are not apart. 
Because it might be that later somebody comes along and says, hey, but your A is an int. Ah, but then they become the same, and then it's okay. So only if I know for sure that they will never, can never become the same later on, then I know that they are apart. And this is represented by this uh, not tilde thing. And then a constraint failure is either the fact that I know that some apartness check succeeded, which means that it is actually typing correct the program, or I know that some type class constraint could not be discharged. So that's our failure. And then a custom error is followed by the message that should be generated when it actually fails in that particular way. Or it's simply a constraint that we want to check because we're not interested in having a special error. We just want to use the error that the Haskell compiler would ordinarily give. Yeah, that's a choice we made here. So what does that mean? How can I now rewrite my atop having special type error diagnosis for all the possible ways in which the inference could fail here. Well, the first thing I do is I check, is D1 a Q diagram, or do I know it's apart from a Q diagram? So for example, D1 is already known to be bool at this point, because we are kind of, this is kind of looked at in the process of solving all these constraints. So maybe it already has information that this D1 is a bool. Well, then bool and Q diagram can never become apart, can never become the same. So then this error message will be generated. And this is a very, not very informative error message, but you can add some details to make it better. The same thing we can do for the D2. Yeah? Is it a Q diagram? And then we have to check, OK, now we know that both are Q diagrams because these are considered in this order. Now we know that both of these are Q diagrams, but that means we can kind of access uh, the fact that the, the backend that I had know at this point. So can I then already verify that the backends are different? If they, I know they are already different at this point, I can generate this error message, backends do not coincide, and so forth. And there's these checks for which we have no special error diagnosis. Yeah? Yeah? And in, in the compiler, this is all changed into some kind of constraint structure that the programmer needs not be aware of. This is the, yeah, the API that you exploit. This is what you write. Now, of course, here I will be writing backends do not coincide. And then if I check v1 against v2, then I get vector spaces do not coincide. What you would probably prefer is that these messages are different, because one talks about vector space, the other about backends. But there is some similarity, some communality there. You would like to exploit them. Right? And this is where you get the reusability of using type level functions. I can write a type level function here, do not coincide, that takes the name of what I'm actually comparing represent it as a text or string in a domain, like vector spaces or backends, and I get two types. And then I do the apartness check, saying, well, if they are known to be apart, then I generate the text, what do not coincide, and I give you the actual types that I was comparing. And this show type, for example, is something that's provided by GHC. It will just give you a textual representation of the type. And now I can write it like this, I can say, Custom errors, I do some checks, and now when they say do not coincide backends, b1, b2, do not coincide vector spaces, v1, v2, and so on. Okay. Now I've done something else here because this is not the only change I made. What I also did here is instead of having one list here of constraints that I'm checking one by one, I now have a list of lists. And what this means is that this constraint will be checked and that constraint will be checked even if both of them or one of them will fail. Because that allows me, because I know that they are independent, I know that the fact that this one can fail is independent of whether this one can fail, but I can give two error messages at once. But if one of these two fails, then I will never consider these. Which makes sense, because then these b1, b2, v1, b, v2, and so forth were never introduced in the first place. Right? So that's a little bit more flexibility that we added. You can also do the sibling thing. Uh, it's a bit more complicated, but the idea is that if I have, for example, here a function that I apply to something that generates a list of ints and something that generates a list of characters, but the function itself takes a character, not an int, what I might have meant is that actually this wrangle should be deleted. If I do that, the program actually becomes type correct because then this operator will kind of throw the information away and the character will flow to this function. And 
well, this is the way that you could encode this in our language. It doesn't need any additional support. Well, a little bit, but, but not very much. Uh, so you can describe this, and actually this is the message you get. You said, well, you have a type error in this particular operator, but if you replace it with this operator, then actually things will be, the problem will be fixed. One other thing you can do is alternatives and conversions. So to the diagrams library, a vector and a point are two different things. So you can measure the length of a vector, but not the length of a point. But to a programmer, maybe he says, well, yeah, I mean, vectors, points are just tuples, right? Uh, but in the case of diagrams, this is not the case. So sometimes you might, for example, wait a minute. So you might, for example, have a function perp, which computes the perpendicular of a vector, and you might give it something which actually is a tuple and not a vector. And then, by means of this specification, you can actually have GEC suggest to you, look, I'm expecting a 2D vector, but I got a tuple. Please use a disconversion function to turn your pair into a tuple, uh, your tuple into a vector. Right? This is actually the, the thing I wrote yesterday, how you can restrict the monad to, uh, to only work for IO monads. And this is this message that you would get. Also works. At least it worked on my computer. And what time, how much time do I have? Eight minutes? Eight minutes? Well, we can at least look a little bit at uh, some kind of demo so that you at least know that I haven't been just typing all the error messages in, but actually there's a G and C version or at least a program that, that actually generates something like this. Well, why not? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So now I want to give a, have a quick look. So this is the formatting library with this Hello World example, right? And uh, so what you can, uh, so our GHCI, so this is our patch of GHC. Uh, if I run it on format X, which is this file, it will actually give, say, uh, for bloody hell, for this format no, now hello world example, 
it will actually suggest the function now expects a builder but was passed a list of characters, which is a string. Hint, you can convert your argument to a builder using from string or turn on the overloaded strings language proper. Right? So actually, if I go into the source file and I uncomment this overloaded strings fragment, so now it's turned on and I do a reload, then actually the first error message is gone. Yeah, so this was actually the fix. So now I've applied the fix and it actually fixed the problem. And this is actually not so strange. If people copy code from the web, maybe this overloaded pragma is not there, right? They just copy the code but don't see the pragma. Uh, here you see another example where uh, it, so where you don't get the hint because it, this hint only works if it happens to be a string that you are passing. But if you pass in an arbitrary list of booleans, for example, like in this case, it doesn't have or it doesn't want to give a special fix. And it does that by actually looking at the type that it's actually looking at. So if it's a string, it gives a special message. It's a list of bools, it gives you the standard error message. Okay, so that's, that's that. Uh, and then the question may be, okay, how does this actually look? Well, it's maybe a bit too big, but... Yeah, so this is actually what you write in your Haskell file for this null function and also one for the percent, which is like a, a compose function for formatters. Uh, and, and here, for example, you see that I call a type level function check for builder that will verify it, whether the, the type you pass in is actually a builder. If it's not a builder, it will actually suggest a fig. It will look at, is it, does it happen to be a string? And it does that over here. So it says, this check for builder says, if I know that I'm not a builder, then first please check, am I a string? If so, give me the special error message for strings. And if not, give me the default message. So no special hint. So for a list of bools, this, this will not succeed that I get here. But if I happen to pass in a string, it actually will succeed. And then I will give you a special error message. Right? Well, this this says so. So this says uh, a, a, a pair will follow where this is a list of uh, possibilities to check. So that for each possibility you can give a special error message, and there's a default to be expected. So it's a generalization of the other one. Yeah, the other. Yeah, so the other arrow. I think I have an example up here as well. So this arrow is like the less general case where where you actually don't have where this list is empty essentially. Right, so that's a special case. Yeah, but this allows me to kind of look at alternatives. Uh, all right. So I think I have to leave my, my, my demo to this, but this is the kind of thing you actually write, for example, for your percent operator and so forth. And it, I'm not saying that this is easy to write. No, uh, because I want people to hire me and Alejandro <laughs> to write this for them and pay us lots of money. <laughs> yeah, because everybody knows that. Yeah, Haskell, that's a way quick way to fast money, but uh, okay, I need to get on with this. So we actually did some of this for quite a number of these libraries, uh, path, diagrams, persistent, things like maps, formatting library. Uh, my students, uh, as a uh, special assignment, they were working on parcel libraries and co-pilot. I said, whatever you fancy, whatever you are uh, experienced with, please use it and add this kind of diagnosis. So I want to recap my slogan here, to have expression level type error diagnosed by type level programming. If there's anything you'd like to take away from this, I think I, maybe that's this. Uh, I do have to say that, well, if you are working in Scala in some other languages, well, there is still something maybe to be added to the language to be able to exploit this. Uh, I also hope that uh, this will become, let's say, the foot in the door. Yeah, that, that, well, that Simon said, well, changes are so minimal to GDC, well, let's put it in the next head. Uh, and then, then people say, oh, this is great. Now we want more. And then we take it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's still laughing now. <laughs> OK, thank you for your attention. So you just said it was hard to write to those conditions to, to express. Well, it, it takes getting used to also. Well, what about the error message of those? The error message? <laughs> yeah, the error messages that you get for when you mistype your conditions. Fuck. <laughs> um, OK, yeah, so, no, so that's, that's a good thing. So actually, I, I omitted it. So, 
So the thing is, we do type level programming. For that, we have no solution. Right. So for that, I guess we need kind level programming <laughs> to address the type level programming error diagnosis problems. Uh, that's, so that's going to be the subject of my next proposal that I'm writing now. No, it isn't. But, uh, but yeah. So yeah, get one level up. So yeah, but indeed, that's something you cannot do. Indeed. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I've done, I've done that. So that's actually the case with the builder and the string. It will actually check, do you happen to be a string? Then you get this error message. Actually, I'm, well, I don't. No, yeah, yeah, at least cases, yes, yes, yes. I mean, but these cases can be general, like you could also say. Uh, Yeah, but that's that's so one that that's invasive. Yeah. So I first need the food in the door. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> <laughs> then we're talking. Oh. The thing is, the you are the one who decides what message to give. But I'm not saying a message. Why not give them? You want you want some you want to update these Haskell files? No. Is that? <laughs> People don't like this. Well, yeah. In, so I have the benefit of not being a Haskell programmer, but in a lot of uh, develop, uh, development environments, there are fix, quick fixes that you could do, and especially at DSL, you have you have a lot more context to give it those fixes. Yeah, and I think you could do it. I guess. Well, so you have pure I guess if you're in an IDE, that could do this. Yeah, but it's just a matter of. Yeah, but and, and the, the other thing you have with either giving examples of code that works, like examples. Yeah, you could do that. Writes, yeah. It's also better for people who don't speak English, which I think. Well, for example, yeah, or or or, or even nicer. You, I, I could make one in Dutch because I want to teach Haskell to primary school students in, uh, in the Netherlands, right? So I, I mean, you can modify everything. Basically, everything is under your own control. Yes. Instead of suggesting to them what's a good way to do it symbolically, as opposed to having them read and understand and then retype. Well, so, well, I mean, for example, with the yeast I just said, look, there's the documentation. Please take a look. Okay. I mean, you also have students. So you know, sometimes you have teachers that kind of work. They want to work on the the egos of their students. So they say every error you make, it says you're an idiot, and then it points to the page in the lecture notes that they have to read to understand how to fix it. But it's the thing is, it's all up to you. Of course, what I cannot do, I mean, everything is, has to be textual because I work in the context of, in this case, GHCI and, and, and GHC, right? And if you have a system that goes beyond that, of course. But you could also, as part of your text, I, I guess with a, with a bit more work in the pretty printing, you could actually kind of display a snippet of code. I'm not so sure. So in Helium, we can actually do that. So we can pretty print pieces of the code, but I'm not so sure whether we have easy access to that kind of information when we build our uh, messages. So that would be something we would need, if that's what you mean. Right. Yeah. 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 So in Helium, we actually do have this. Huh? So because that's what I mean. So you need to be able to, you have to you need to be able to access this at this type level. And that's, so in Helium, I have more control because we built a compiler. And here we kind of very light it. We're, we're like lodgers, hey? we're staying in GHC hotel, and then yeah, we just have to make do with what we get. Yeah. Yes.